today. I'm super, super happy uh, to have Carolina with me here. Um, are you here? Yes, I, I can see you. Carolina is from OneSkin, and um, I, I know that at least one person here in this uh, group is actively, uh, you know, um, let's say, um, functioning as your guinea pig. Uh, and so I'm super, super excited to have you uh, discuss one project's really exciting work. I'm going to share a recent a link to a recent talk that uh, you gave at a recent online conference here in the chat as well. I'm going to share uh, some more info on your organization and on yourself here in the chat. But this is kind of like the um, kind of like um, kickoff of community updates. So if you have another update after uh, Carolina, then uh, go for it afterwards. But for now, Carolina, the stage is yours. Tell us about OneSkin. What's new? So thanks, Alison. Uh... Hi everyone, I don't know if everyone is familiar with what we are doing. Uh, so OneSkin has been working for the past four and a half years to study skin aging biology. So basically we replicate skin aging with 3D models and then we can evaluate the change both in the morphology and also in the gene expression. Um, and we have also developed a skin-specific molecular clock that we can measure the age of those tissues that we grow in the lab. Uh, so similar to Harvard has done, we have done a, we have built a clock that's specific for skin tissue, and then the accuracy is higher. And finally, we have uh, developed a cell-based screening platform to to find a new senotherapeutic the therapeutic compounds, and we have validated uh, those compounds in several models of uh, skin aging, um, UVB, senescence model, and also uh, replicative senescence. And then we have formulated this peptide. We have evaluated first the safety in different studies of toxicity, mutagenesis, uh, karyotyping, skin sensitization. And then finally, we have formulated this peptide in a topical application that we have tested both in our 3D models and also in this ex vivo skin or skin biopsies. Um, and we have seen an improve in the skin uh, epidermal layer thickness. So we see that the skin gets thicker with the treatment. So maybe I can share my screen a little bit. I think it's easier for you guys just to visualize what I'm saying, because I know that most of you are probably not familiar with uh, skin models. Is a is a different model that uh, most people use. And I can share this presentation later. Alison, you can share with everyone. I will I always keep the introduction here, but basically our focus is to find new senotherapeutic compounds uh, to prolong skin health. And we believe that skin has been overlooked in this area of longevity, but it's our largest organ and plays a very important role in our health, mainly as we age after, you know, 50 years, your skin starts to deteriorate and to accumulate senescent cells and those senescent cells start secreting uh, inflammatory uh, signals that can compromise your uh, overall level of inflammation. So I will skip the introduction and I will go to the part where we are replicating the skin in the lab. So this is just a comparison with the models that we grow with a human skin biopsy. You can see that we are replicating the main layers of the skin. Uh, derms, epiderms, and the stratum corneum. And then we can predict very well uh, what we test in vitro and correlate with the outcome in vivo. So we are not only replicating skin, but also skin aging. So by using cells from donors of you know a variety of ages, we can show, uh, we can replicate a very young skin, neonatal skin up to a very aged skin. And we can see how the structure, the morphology changes over aging. Uh, and we see also the gene expression uh, related to markers uh, associated with aging, inflammation, proliferation, extracellular matrix. And we have an, a huge panel of genes that we characterize those models. Uh, 
this is the skin molecular clock that we have developed. This is also available for research. So in this website, um, mallclock.com, um, you can upload your data and you can use this clock to calculate uh, skin biological age. And uh, this is just a comparison with Harvard's clock, skin and blood. And here we could, uh, when we validate with an external data set, we could predict with a lower error, so a better accuracy. And then we can use this clock to uh, evaluate, you know, skin diseases, conditions, or treatments if we are reducing uh, the biological age. So these are the markers that we use to screen uh, the senotherapeutic molecules. We use ATRX for Psi and also beta-galactosidase. That's a very well-known marker for senescent cells. Uh, this is the screening that we have done, very similar to what was published before uh, in the HSP90 inhibitor. So most of our molecules, they, they decrease the level of senescence, but they don't decrease the total cell number. Uh, they are more senomorphic or than senolytic. So if we compare with ABT, we see a huge decrease in the total cell number. Uh, this is the validation of our lead compound. We see a decrease uh, in the senescent cell burden by 25 to 40%. We validate in donors, uh, different donors, and we mainly use primary cells and uh, also cells that are not uh, uh, transformed. So, or we use cells derived from progeroid patients or uh, elderly donors. And, and, and yes, we, we do induce senescence with UVB radiation. So this experiment, we are showed that we are in, if increasing the dose of UVB, we are increasing the levels of senescence uh, in two di different cell lines. And if we treat those cells after the damage, we prevent the accumulation of senescent cells uh, to a very significant uh, extent. And then this is trying to validate the mechanism of action of our peptide. So we see that we induce the DNA damage and then after treatment, we decrease uh, some very classic DNA damage markers such as uh, phospho gamma H2X, we decrease P21, uh, phospho AKT, and phospho NEF kappa B. And this is so is decreasing the signs, the pathways that are inducing to senescence, to the production of, of CESP. So in the end, we have a lower accumulation of senescent cells. Um, when we treat aged skins with our molecules, we see an improvement in the whole uh, morphology, the histology, and we can quantify this with a skin score. And we also have uh, measured the skin biological age and we have seen a decrease in this biological age uh, in a large extent if we compare with retinoic acid. That's a very common molecule used for skin rejuvenation, but retinoic acid is usually associated with a lot of inflammation and other side effects that can be damaging your skin more in the long term. So these are the topical treatment and skin explants. So these are real human skin. When we uh, treat the skin topically with this cream containing the peptide, we see an increase in the, the epidermal thickness. Uh, with retinol, again, we don't see this effect. We see this upper layers coming out like a peeling effect. And again, when we measure the biological age, we could see a significant decrease in this case, around th three years of decrease um, after five, day five days treatment. So these are the safety studies. I won't go through all of them. Um, these are the uh, proof of concept 
clinical study that we have done, we treated patients for 12 weeks, and we have not only seen an improvement in several aspects of skin appearance, firmness, elasticity, but we also have seen an improvement in the skin barrier that's related to the main function of the skin. Uh, and this uh, shows a very good correlation with the data that we have found in vitro in the in, uh, that's related to the increase of the epidermal thickness, lower amount of senescent cells, inflammation, and a decrease in the biological age. And finally, we have tested this molecule in C. elegans to uh, evaluate if we could have applications beyond the skin. And we saw very interesting uh, data showing an, an increase in the median lifespan uh, when we treated with one micromolar by around 16%. And more interesting than that, the worms, they were more active throughout their lives. So if you see the control, the worms are very active in the you know, initial days and they stop moving as they age. And with OS1 treatment, they continue very active and we saw an in an increase of almost like 300% in some of, the con uh, some of the groups. So this is more related to health span than lifespan. And I think this is what really interests most of us. Uh, yeah, here, here I have a short video just show how the worms here in the treated group, that they move much faster than the non-treated. And uh, yeah, we are bringing this product to the market now in October, uh, direct to consumer through our website. And um, yeah, here it's our team. Um, uh, we are four PhD founders and uh, we have other aging experts in our team as well. And our um, marketing team that we are building right now as we go direct to consumer we need to learn how to communicate the whole science in a very effective and simple way. Uh, board of Advisors, um, and that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if it was too fast, but I know I no, want to be Oh, this is one. awesome. Yeah. How, much, how much is one, one, one cream pot? <laughs> Uh, it's going to be $120 for 50 ml, but you can also subscribe and then you get a discount. It could, it could go to $100 or $79. Okay, awesome. Any questions, comments from this group? Yes, Kriyan. Yeah, I, I want, so um, I'm sorry if you said this and I spaced out, but um, with the results on the, um, on the worms, it uh, really makes me now wonder, what do you know about the molecular mechanisms? What's actually going on with this compound? How, like, did it come from, and, and the secondary question to that is, is did the formulation come from a sort of first principles hypothesis about what you wanted to make, or was this some sort of combinatorial thing where you finally found something that works? Yeah, so I start for the, the uh, by the second question. So we start, we had, we had this hypo hypothesis of targeting senescent cells on the skin, and then we need a library to start screening. So we collaborated with a professor uh, that was researching antimicrobial peptides. So we started with an initial library of 200 peptides, and we got to four hits. And then from these four hits, we use an algorithm to do uh, not random permutations, but it was uh, comparing the sequence that were performing better, you know, against the sequence that were not performing well. We generated another 800 peptides. We screened again, um, and then we got to five peptides, and eventually we, 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 we decided to stick with OS1. So now that we know that as OS1 decreases the accumulation of senescent cells, yes, that's our goal to understand the whole mechanism of action. So we hypothesize that it's more a prevention uh, effect in terms of preventing the release of SAS uh, factors. Uh, when, because when we treat it, cells from elderly donors, we don't see a lot of apoptosis. We are also interested in, in evaluating 
uh, autophagy, we, is, we, in the RNA seq, we see some genes related to autophagy, but we need to evaluate deeper if we are inducing autophagy, but we don't see uh, um, signs of apoptosis very clear. When we induce uh, senescence with UVB, that's a more acute damage. And then what we see, it's more an increase of the DNA repair capacity. So uh, we are combining these different models, but basically we are decreasing, we are increasing the DNA repair capacity or the, the pathways related to that. And then we are um, decreasing the pathways that are inducing the signaling to SAS factors, inflammations, and end up to senescence. So for example, we have seen a decrease in TGF beta-1 receptor. Uh, so peptides, they usually, they don't have like one specific target that's going to lead to only one pathway. So in the end, it's probably a combination of different scenarios that leads to this uh, end point of decreasing uh, senescent cells and inflammation. And one follow-up question. Is this peptide naturally occurring in humans or is it uh, completely uh, exogenous? Yeah, it's a new and synthetic peptide. When we when we did the blast analysis, we found a homology of seventy percent of the sequence, but not a hundred percent. So it's not completely naturally occurring in the body. What stage are you at with um, fundraising? Did you do? Did you yeah. did you get delayed due to COVID? Yeah, I mean, we raised a post-seed round, so we are now pre-series A. Our goal is to launch the product, hopefully get a good traction from the market, and then raise series A in the next few months.